for the place that's almost home. Horseshoes and hand grenades, piney woods where old boys roam. With their rifle and their girlfriend, they're gonna make their mama proud. But Barry Pie, the rebel colors fly, and you never think out loud. Welcome to the Something in the Water podcast. I'm Uncle Dave Griffin. And I'm Sean Clark. And our guest this time, Magnetic South, the Valdosta duo, Mr. John Paris and Mike Mink. Glad to have y'all guys. Great to be here finally. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of things that distract us nowadays. Indeed. (laughs) Diseases and rashes <laughs> and uh, <laughs> popcorn. Unexplained phenomena. Unexplained phenomena. Yep. Tension spans. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, y- y'all are Valdosta based. We are. We are. Yeah. I'm, I think we both, at least I was born there and I've known mm-hmm. his family since about the time I was born. His, he's got a brother that's within a couple of months of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, so I've, I grew we grew up together, but I don't think he was born in Valdosta, but he's lived there most of his life. Right. So we're, we're essentially Valdostans, right? Or were you born there? Yeah, I was. I was oh, okay. like, can I answer for myself? Are you oh, okay. No, <laughs> are you speaking yeah, for me right. today? Uh, John's, John's, John, no, John, John's my mouthpiece. <laughs> were, were either of y'all. You'll have the sweet tea. Uh, was either of y'all's uh, families tied to the Air Force? No. No. Okay. Mm-mm. My, um, my dad was a minor league baseball player, and a long time ago, Valdosta had minor league baseball. They had a Dodgers um, farm club, and he played. How about that? As he oh. puts it, he went in the Korean War, a Brooklyn Dodger, and came out an L.A. Dodger, but it never really mattered. He never made it that high. but Right. That was where just, the farm just, just, just system Where his was. mail came from. Yeah. Training facility, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. White Cross had one, too, mm-hmm. out at the airport, the, the uh, Braves. Right. Mm. The Braves were out there mm-hmm. many a long time ago. Cool. That is cool. Yeah, my folks uh, came down because my dad had a professional opportunity. Uh, he's an architect or was an architect, and um, he went to Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. And one of his classmates was from this area, and they opened up a practice. Uh, so he came down and joined that. And so that's that's how you know all my – all my family is from Bristol, birthplace of country music, actually. Virginia. Yeah. 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 Virginia and slash Tennessee. Tennessee. Yeah, it's right on the state line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've like stood in the middle of State Street many times as a boy I and mean, been in both states. But so they came down here in 64, 65, I think it was. And mm-hmm. then I came along. So uh, that's that's how I ended up in the flatlands. Well, we was talking <clears throat> a while ago about uh, Michigan. What was uh, you lived up there briefly, or no? Mm-hmm. My grandmother, grandmother, my dad's okay. mom. You know, which again from Bristol, but she, uh, after my grandfather died, he died very young of a heart attack, and she, uh, she ended up uh, working for a while in um, the Washington D.C. area, mm-hmm. and um, she met a, a man from Michigan who worked in the auto industry as a designer, as an engineer, mm-hmm. and so she ended up in Michigan for most of my childhood and adolescence. I think she eventually moved back to Bristol. In the nineties, yeah, but uh, yeah. So she lived in Muskegon, Michigan. So Muskegon, yeah, on the west coast of the state. Yeah, like you know, you get to go visit. I did went up there many times. <laughs> yeah, the summers were much nicer. The winters up there were unreal, like you know, five feet of snow kind of thing. You know, yeah. was, well, wow. uh, amazingly, I know a little tidbit about Muskegon. Uh, Bill Simpson, I think, uh, lived mm-hmm. there. The producer, yeah, yeah, his. Uh, just a little fact. <laughs> yeah, he produced the James Gang and the Eagles, and he produced a Who album, I think. And I did not know that till five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. So his mom, Bill Simzik's mom, lived 
either next door or or right below. I can't remember in a, in the apartment complex where my grandmother lived. Yeah. And so they were good friends. And so <laughs> all during my childhood, which was sort of the salad days of the Eagles, I I, I met him once in, when I was up there. But then also I got I've got like a autographed copy of an Eagles album. It's probably valuable. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And um got pictures of him. And so I'd always hear about what project he was working on mm-hmm. through my grandmother. So and you know I, I had an interest in music anyway. But that you know that made me feel connected to something you know that was happening out there in the world. That's so. right. Interesting, uh, interesting experience. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, glad I didn't grow up with his last name. I know there's a lot of those kind of names been up hell there for a first grader. Yep, <laughs> probably hell for every teacher he had. <laughs> the Upper Midwest, though, is full of those sort of German, yeah, Eastern European. S C Z Y M Z Y K or something. Yeah, yeah. Too many Skirmish. Bill Skirmish. I know. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, that was a neat experience. Mm-hmm. So, so, how long have y'all been playing as a duo? Well, this is. Uh, no, go ahead. No, I mean, I, you know, he and I have known each other as far as musician wise since the 80s, the mm-hmm. 1980s. But we first played together in a band and starting in about 1995. We were in a band called 16 Tons all through the second half of the 90s into the probably beginning of the 2000s. But then, um, and then we played on and off, and then he he would occasionally fill in uh, about a decade ago with Magnetic South when mm-hmm. it was the the full band. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually Chris Tillman was playing bass at that time. Uh, but he was in St. Simons, and so Mike would fill in some. And then um, about about a year ago, or a little less than a year ago, uh, we kind of reached out to each other and let's start playing to get together again, and mm-hmm. it's worked out great. So, in that, did I get the timeline right? I think so. I, I, it all blends together and runs together. And yeah, that's the thing. We, uh, I yeah, feel like I, I've known you forever. I had the misfortune of my my two best uh, my my two best friends as musicians are both bass players, and so it's hard to get them in the same <laughs> band, the same space. You know, mm-hmm. Chris and and Mike. But I'm going to do it one of these days because you know a lot of we've had a lot of bass players on here uh, most recently, and they all more or less coming out of the same thing it's like how did you start and they say it was thrust upon us <laughs> it's not, not, not like, me though okay, no I, i've just, actually just i've always wanted to be a bass player i went backwards i actually started as a bass player i, I know guitar but it was mainly just so i could kind of i wanted to see what which did you learn your first bass bass mm-hmm. me too that was um, my first I, I um i've always heard bass lines i like bass lines i just mm-hmm. same experience here i just I always loved music, you know, but uh, when you get to a certain age, like 14, 15, or 16, you, the wheels start moving for you, you know, and most that's when most kids put away their trumpets and saxes <laughs> from middle school band and trade it for guitars and drums and bass. And uh, you can start picking out. Oh, this is the drum. This is the, right, yeah, right. The, yeah, I was just a man. And... I was buying albums really for the first time, starting my collection, and my ear would go straight to that bass guitar out of all of it. You know, I was just fascinated by that. Hmm. that we kind of the same there. What was the first thing you learned? First thing I learned was um, very early on. I remember learning Brick House. Cool. Know, boom, 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 boom. Good little yeah. funky bass line. Um, I can remember doing that whole smoke on the water riff, but but the guitar <laughs> riff, which is not the bass riff, which everyone don't, gets wrong. Don't, 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 don't. The, the, the bass riff is really just more of a boom, 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 boom. But anyway. Anyway, I learned that one. Um all the usuals. I don't know. Just I just So what year did you say you was born? I was born in sixty three. Three. Yeah. Okay. So my sixtieth year on this here planet. Wow! Yeah, uh, yeah I know. Say it out loud; it makes me hurt. <laughs> you were ten, 10 years old, and you'd have been uh, about twelve or thirteen when I played my first gigs over there. Yeah. Oh, in uh, Valdosta, King of the Road. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 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 I've, I've and and I we played Brick House too. One of the, I bet one one of the worst load ends there ever's been. It's, it's multi leveled. It's through. It's just horrible. Yeah. But, did, you, did you play there too, Mike? I've played there a couple times, but it more recently by 
by that, by that I mean the last 20 years. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's I don't even know if they're doing anything with it now. That big old beautiful yeah. red room or whatever yeah. they call it had red walls and red yeah. carpeting. And, mm-hmm. you know, the last time it was open as a restaurant was probably 15, 18 years ago. I don't wow. I don't even know what that building's been. Is it still there? I think, I think it's still it is. a hotel and yeah, yeah still there. Was yeah. The last time yeah. I stopped by there, and I was wanting to take some of y'all or, or maybe Connor or somebody to just say, that's where daddy, that's where your daddy played back in the day. Hmm. And, I know a uh, lot of people that played there. and looked uh, like it was all, you know, padlocked or something. I don't, mm-hmm. Or they, uh, somewhere along the way, I heard that they had retired it as a, venue and was using it strictly for conventions or something like that. Hmm. Maybe so, yeah. Times change. Yeah, back in 75, October 75, I first went over there. And that side of Valdosta was nothing, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Farmland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was a, there was a driving range mm-hmm. out there and yeah. one hotel mm-hmm. next to the driving range. And across the street from that, where the uh, that road that cuts from uh, might be Gornto. Is that where Gornto mm-hmm. comes out right there? Mm-hmm. It ends there at St. Augustine. Right mm-hmm. there uh, on the right was a gas station called Valdosta Village. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had uh, on Fridays, they had a little tiny uh, kitchen uh Right there in it, and they they made the best catfish and cheese grits. Wow. Mm-hmm. I remember going in there as a kid. But I don't think I ever ate there. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But That's it was neat. nothing out there back then. Mm-hmm. I know. Well, tell us about uh, your uh, Magnetic South uh, and what kind of music do y'all do? Well, the, the whole idea, you know, because, of course, you know, I've – I've played original music, you know, mm-hmm. until recently, almost exclusively uh, over all the years, including back when it was, you know, pretty hard road to hoe. Um, well, let's talk the, about that. Yeah, late '80s and early '90s, and even through the '90s and the early 2000s, you know, it was pretty, pretty tough, you know, because there's just not a lot of original mm-hmm. venues in this area. But Magnetic South came by cause, just because I wanted to have sort of a, um, you know, sort of a troop of people that would play the original material and sort of a collective of people that, you know, um, that were from the area, you know, that had a very Southern approach to, you know, mm-hmm. sort of, uh, you know, rock music and, you know, sort of roots rock, I guess, you know, I guess what people call Americana now, but, um, mm-hmm. yeah. So it started probably, I think our very first time we played it, it was actually John Paris and magnetic South for a lot of years. Uh, I did that just in case I played, you know, solo shows so people would recognize and there'd be, be mm-hmm. continuity. Um, probably about 2009 is when this project started. And I had done a solo album prior to that, that Mike played on, um, and, uh, called O law. And it was, it turned, we actually did probably enough material for an album, but it, it, it was released as an EP. I think I had six or seven songs on it. O law. O law. Mm-hmm. That my grandmother, not the one Ooh, in Michigan. Law. Exactly. Would say that <laughs> Oh law when, it, like, when I was cutting up or whatever. Well, I'd if be in, he had said, Lord, you'd have been cut. Exactly. Yeah. You'd exactly. Be, or you'd have been. You'd be in deep trouble. Yeah. That was, yeah. uh, I, that was a exactly nice workaround. Custom, but for, you don't use the Lord name right. in vain. That's right. what it says. Right. So, so that might have been vain. Yep. That's where that Ooh, came from. Law. Yeah. <laughs> so we had done that. And, uh, and so, I, you know, and I wasn't in a band situation. And so I developed that and, um, we played out a good bit, um, 2009 to 2014 ish or so. Um, in that iteration. And Mike was occasionally involved in that. He was playing with other bands, but he would sometimes mm-hmm. fill in on bass when Chris couldn't come over from St. Simon's to play with us. Um, but then for a long time, because of m- more personal life issues on my account than anything, we kind of just were a recording unit and we was, you know, slowly and steadily worked on the next project that turned into what became Motel Trance, the, the essentially double album of material mm-hmm. that it, I came out with about four years ago. Um, sort of slowly and steadily worked on that, self-produced. Um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of the whole Magnetic South thing. And then um, that came out, and a little bit after that, you know, I, um, I was wanting to get back out and, and playing again. And so I reached out to Mike because, you know, we're, you know, we can finish each other's sentences, you know. So, 
And, uh, and he's like, yeah, let's, let's do something. And so it came together really nicely. And so we've been, so now we, we just kind of go as magnetic South and we've played primarily duo shows, but we do have uh, a guy that plays drums with us uh, named Scott Pruden. He's, ba he's from Valdosta, but he's, he's lived for a lot of years in Tallahassee mm -hmm. with his family. And so uh, we mm -hmm. actually have a first uh, full band gig towards the end of this month uh, over at Ashley street station in Valdosta. Okay. So looking forward to, Having the playing loud, yeah, <laughs> playing loudly with electric instruments because mm -hmm. that's most of what I've done. You know, I've kind of been in, uh, I've been in Sean Clark mode the last few months and playing a lot of acoustic guitar, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's been been a been a learning process. You know, usually I write on acoustic but play electric gigs, but um, yeah, so that'll be an interesting change to get back to the electrics for sure. So, yeah, I've been trying to get back into the electric. I've got guitars and amps and just. I've been playing acoustic so long now that it's like I'm over, I overplay or over strum or whatever. Mm -hmm. We we had a real practice with a threesome last weekend and it was ear ringing fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fun to be loud. I just kind of kept sitting back and leaning against the wall, going, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is that this was, is rock and roll, baby." Yeah, that was nice. It's a whole different set of. Yeah energies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well just for the li uh, watchers and listeners uh he said uh, later on this month they'd be at uh ashley street station time you see this they'll be done played at ashley street station <laughs> so we were great yeah awesome. were great. we were awesome too yeah. you should you missed it yep mm -hmm. sort of beatles at the cavern club type of situation yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah game changer <laughs> Yeah, that's a little tricky. We do actual time travel on this program. You played at uh, Swamp Town Get Down in 2013. Is, uh, I believe it was John Paris and Magnetic South. We, was, did, we did. Yeah, it was yeah. me and Chris Tillman on bass and Dudley Johnson on drums. And Dudley was, you know... Uh, Played on played on the Motel Trance album and played with mm -hmm. us for a lot of years and, and in fact Mike and I tried to to make it work with Dudley but Dudley's been, he's consistently been playing and so he's with another band now over in Valdosta um, and it, the schedule with that other band was just too busy so that's when we decided even though Scott lives you know hour and fifteen minutes away that we would you know get him back involved and he was he was glad to and you know the logistics are challenging with mm -hmm. but you know we all have families and we're grown ups and so we have to make it work, you know, mm -hmm. and make things happen. But so yeah, the the two thousand thirteen show was a lot of fun. That, mm -hmm. that was that was another enjoyably loud oh, experience. Yeah. yeah. And that was that was that was nice. But we were supposed yeah. to play a, as a quartet, but our guitar player couldn't make it that day. Uh, he had a he had a work shift or something that, you know, he couldn't get out of. So we had to do the trio format. So <laughs> yeah. that was fun though. Yep. That's music for you. You have to constantly adapt to That's all right. kinds of little uh, situations. Mm -hmm. And it's how well you adapt that uh, really kind of makes you, makes you or breaks you, you know. I've seen, Absolutely. I've seen some bands, you know, something will go wrong. That's like, you know, you got to check. You got to make sure the chords work. You got to make mm -hmm. sure everything is in working condition before you get out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I know that's kind of if, almost impossible to do. You know, and you if trust you're like that it's going to work again. <laughs> if you're like me and Connor, you get there and you're like, we forgot the PA. We forgot the cajon. Got the guitar. I've done, <laughs> that. I've done that before, forgotten my guitar. We've yeah. we've done all those things. But somehow, like, even, so, even through that, we make it happen somehow. Mm -hmm. like, we're just you can, lucky, you can just bill it as a true acoustic show. We, yeah. uh, the, with the we didn't forget the PA. We forgot the bag with every cable in it. Uh, but luckily, we were the only spot we could have played without a PA. You know, it was a small little deck <laughs> situation. And people who saw us there all the time didn't even know we weren't playing through, or they didn't seem to. It didn't matter, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a place we play now that uh, it's a, it's actually like a little wine bar that's a newer business in Valdosta, and it's so small that. You know, I don't even think we need a PA. I mean, like, look, like sometimes I'm, I tell them, am I on? <laughs> you know, but it, and I am, but it's just, it's such yeah. a small, intimate room that I think we could, we could possibly get away with playing acoustic there. Yeah, but it's also kind of cool that it, you, 
just talking about being loud a minute ago. You get to learn a whole new dynamic. Yeah. You got to play. Mm-hmm. To me, it's harder. To These be people are in here. Quiet. They're wanting to have a conversation yes. and keep the ten feet away from you, and but still are listening and being entertained. And it's mm-hmm. just so you got a little different set of chops, but you can't just you know. It's much harder to sing to me. Like if it's a quiet thing, it's like. It's, yeah, yeah. The, sometimes I just get all the way over here and just sing yeah. as loud as I would normally, you know, mm-hmm. and just you know. I've learned a lot about that, about you know, managing dynamics mm-hmm. since in this duo situation, and I think it's really helped me vocally a lot to be, you know, a little more nuanced as a singer, you know, and, and deliver the song in a way that you know, because you just you have to when you don't have that, you know, that PA and. You know, you're you're singing above AI, and you have to be forceful and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So it's, I think it's been enjoyable, and it's it's also Absolutely. fun hearing Mike sing because he he'll sing two or three songs in a set to give me a little bit of a break, and then I do some harmonies for him, and mm-hmm. yeah, and you know, working mic techniques, you know, that kind of thing. Because we he and I have different different generally like volume levels in terms right. of how we project, and so learning to manage that is <laughs> part of the style. Louder, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a pretty loud <laughs> singer, so this is my standard, my baseline, so. Come from the old punk rock days. If I can hear myself, it's something wrong. <laughs> it's like, oh, gotta, I'm, I'm too loud. Mm-hmm. So I back off. But just now, are y'all doing any original writing in this band? As at, to this point, it's funny. I'm driving over here. Mm-hmm. You know, had an hour to chit chat as we drove over from about Austin. We were talking about sort of making plans for like you know. I have a, a, a cache of material mm-hmm. myself. And then we also talked about writing some stuff. And, mm-hmm. and then of course, you know, I have a lot of, I, in fact, I, have, I probably have more uh, recording equipment than live music equipment. Right. Um, so, you know, we're, we're talking about possibly doing that maybe even in the summer because mm-hmm. okay. this currently, we, well, you know, and it's been kind of fun because again, it's another part of the dynamics thing of singing, but we, you know, this is the first situation where we've, I've ever played like all covers, but, you know, some of them are, you know, covers that we've chosen because we like them, you know, they're not, you know, they're not sort of pandering type covers or but we, we do a few that are easily recognizable. But um, that's been kind of fun. But, you know, but ultimately we both are we both come from, you know, the tradition of original music. You know, mm-hmm. in fact, I was going to mention that, you know, one of the things that was super influential on me, you know, I mean, I, I deeply love music and started playing guitar, you know, as a 10 or 11 year old. But uh, his first band. Um, played in, I think it was fall of 1984. They were called Inspector 13 and they were a punk band. Okay. And, um, and, you know, they, they had, I don't know, six or eight songs, but they played at the American Legion, you know, mm-hmm. right there by the football stadium in Valdosta. And that was used to be a really common live music venue back in the eighties. And they just blew me away. I was like, this is so awesome. And it's like, and it was also, it was like, you know, Hey, I can do that, you know? And I saw, you know, Mike doing it. And then I knew a couple of other guys in the band distantly remotely, and so that was really influential on me, you know, as far as making me want to get out there and do it. And but also too, I was like, wow, they're they do they're doing their own songs, you know. They're not doing, you know, Bachman Turner mm-hmm. Overdrive or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing you know punk music. It's like our generation's music, you know. And so that was really cool. And and then he continued to do that. And then eventually I got out there. And so then eventually our, you know, we were able to kind of cross pollinate. So, mm-hmm. um, do you ever do any writing, Mike? Yeah, I write. Um, mm-hmm. uh, going back to the conversation we were literally just having on the way over here today, both of us have always kind of, I mean, he, he's much more the songwriter of the band, but its we'll bring something in. It's pretty much done. Mm-hmm. It might get tweaked here and there, but we've been talking. I've got a lot of snippets. i got a lot of pieces. Mm-hmm. i got some music. I've got some lyrics. I've got some that are almost finished, but we're going to talk about this summer trying to get together and just do some co stuff like that and just see what it lands you know just kind of beat it together i just look forward to doing it with someone else for a while beat Mm -hmm. off you just have another (laughs) sounding board really Mm -hmm. yeah because for so many years i uh i kind of labored under the whole you know sort of solo songwriter thing where you know i wanted to you know come up with uh you know the melody and the lyrics and all that and one thing we, we talked about today was you know like you know i've got one thing that happened oddly during the pandemic during the lockdown 2020 is I came up with a lot of um, almost fully formed songs that, but without lyrics, you know, usually lyrics, oh, okay. I, I had ton, I would have a surplus of lyrics mm-hmm. and you know, try to figure out something that was a little bit original sound and or interesting sound and musically, but I've got 
probably five songs now that, you know, I've, 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 you know, I'm seeing like, what can I, you know, what can I say here? You know, yeah. I even, even some of them on the demos, I'll, I'm, I'm not singing, but I've got the melody line mm-hmm. even, but there's no lyrics. And so one of the things that we're looking forward to doing is collaborating and really doing some, and some co-writing, um, you know, cause I mean, I, I think that's going to be fun. Cause the thing is too, about me is I've never been a big, uh, solo performer, you know, like yeah. playing in, groups you know mm-hmm. and so then i thought well the, the sort of the logical conclusion of that would also be to co-write sometimes you know yeah mm-hmm. and especially since too i mean used to i mean i would just you know it'd be like water off a duck's back writing songs especially in my 20s and 30s just pow 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 you know mm-hmm. and you get when you get older and you get busier sometimes you know you have to be sort of artificially you know start that process and yeah. you have to kind of you have to you know inspiration's not happening so you have to perspiration it so i, I love we'll, it we'll uh, try some of that i mean it's songwriting is is just uh, always been my uh my life you know my passion and uh there's just so many so many ways to do it you know yeah uh always the end result though is always satisfied uh especially when you finish one you know mm-hmm. you get it all the way to the end but there's so many ways to do it co-writing is just one of them mm-hmm. and like you said the music comes fully formed or the words come fully formed uh, or for the most part, they always kind of walk in together with me. But uh, every mm. now and then something That's nice happens. when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah. mm-hmm. I've kind of found that when I get to a certain point and put it aside, that's where I lose the momentum when I just, no, oh, well, I can't figure out anything it's else to tough. go with this one. It is a tough when it process kinda just, too. Because it kind of flows sometimes and that happens mm-hmm. and then it's like, hey, and then I, if I come back to it later, I go, I don't even remember what I was thinking, what mood yeah. I was in, why I was writing this. Yeah. It means something. I don't I'll, know what I'll it means. I'll get to that stopping point. I, I seem to can never, I'll, I'll get a verse, a chorus, mm-hmm. and I'm like, all right, what's up, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, pull somebody else in. and It's funny. That's where, to me, where uh, the real hard work comes in when you just everything flows to a certain point and you say, yeah, okay. Oh God, I got to write another verse. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you go second verse, same as the first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always, I, I like to write in word processing, you know, so I'll just copy that first verse, paste it down here below that chorus and try to line up my next thoughts and words and everything with the, I, I strive for the same Rhythm, and uh, uh, what you call it? Oh, syllables, meter, meter, yeah, same A-B-D, meter, A-B-D, same. A-B-D, same. Yeah. If A-B-D, it's, yeah, I saw a guy <laughs> who went to town, then that next one's gonna have to be da 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 da, mm-hmm. as close as you can get it, yeah. You know? Jimmy Webb, I read a book by him, he's a great songwriter. Oh, yeah, he was very clinical with it, though. Uh, I missed this book, I, I couldn't even finish it. He was like. The way I picture a song is is building a house. Uh, you have to have a foundation, a strong foundation. <laughs> and and he was getting into all of these little things. It was almost like he was anal, you know, with his uh, process. I'm sure it, <laughs> it served him well, but <laughs> yeah. it got me going like, uh, there ain't no right way and wrong way, Jimmy Webb. He, uh, it's funny you mention him. I, well, we do, uh, Mike and I do, uh, Wichita lineman. Yeah. Um, yes. you really enjoy doing that. It's a, oh, that's it's a really beautiful. fun song mm-hmm. to sing. It's a beautiful mm-hmm. melody. And, you know, it's funny when I think he may, maybe either sent a, you know, a lead sheet of it to Glenn Campbell or sent like a, like a basic, you know, cassette recording. And he's like, it's not finished, but see what you think. Mm-hmm. And, but, and then literally before Glenn Campbell ever replied to that, Glenn Campbell's like, wow. And, re- <laughs> and recorded it. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, and so his whole adult life, Jimmy Webb has been like frustrated that like, you know, I didn't really finish that song, you know, but, wow. but that's, yeah. like, that's like that old saying, you know, art is not finished. It's abandoned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that's the, the case. And yeah, but that, that was the first one, wasn't it? That started off their relationship. Was so. it, was it, uh, by the time I got to Phoenix, was that after, was that next? I can't or, remember, I know, I can't remember which remember one order. came first, but, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. I I, that's remember. a beautiful. Uh, I, I order yeah. wise, no. I, I, I that's a beautiful re- collaboration but, right yeah, there. Jimmy Webb and Glenn yep. Campbell that's worked like well Bert together. Bacharach finding Dion Warwick. Mm-hmm. You know? Exactly. <laughs> Did you ever have you ever heard Glenn Campbell's uh, collaboration with Brian Wilson? 
It's called Guess I'm Dumb. It uh-huh. came out like late 65, you know, before he was, you know, he was on Capitol already, but he wasn't well known. Yeah, wait a minute. It's yeah. like a missing Beach Boys song. Yeah, it's yeah, incredible. Yeah. Well, that's right. He played with the Be- he did. Beach he did. Boys. He played. He was a session guy. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. And then, yeah, he toured with them too. Yeah, he toured traveled with them that when one Brian time. couldn't mm-hmm. tour. Yeah, listen to Guess I'm Dumb, especially the, I think the only version that exists that's in, is in mono, but I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a, it sounds like a, a Pet Sounds outtake. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's a great song. I bought a, a Three Dog Night. Uh, anthology and there was some you know like they'll play uh, unheard tracks on there or uh, um, throw offs you know from a session or something but it had uh, some demos of their the three lead singers other bands while, while they were leading up to Three Dog Night you know hmm. uh, one of them was uh uh, Danny Hutton, yeah. I guess was his name, mm-hmm. the black-headed one. Uh, he uh, he had a couple of songs on there that was I yeah I was in fact, in fact they were written by Brian Wilson. That's too. right. I, I, uh, I you thought, heard yeah. those? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I've forgotten that they worked yeah. together. Yeah. Rainbows and Roses, I think, was mm-hmm. one of them, but uh, but yeah, I didn't know. Uh, Brian Wilson wrote anything for Three Dog Night. Well, I think it was more that Danny uh, Hutton before okay. Three Dog Night yeah, had yeah, done some was, demos. It was, with, it was demos yeah. and stuff. Okay. I think the three of them, by the time they finally found one another, still pre Three Dog Night, uh, they were doing some uh, demos with Brian Wilson and stuff. That was that was the day, the days <laughs> to be in California. Oh, I know. 60s and yeah, early 70s. Interesting stuff. Uh, Laurel Canyon. Oh, yeah. And that bunch. You know, it's, speaking of songwriting and writing alone, uh, before I, I was on my way to pick up Mike to come out here, and first time in ages I listened to, I don't know if y'all are familiar with it, but um, Jesse Winchester, his first album. Have y'all ever heard that? It's it's. I may have a long time yeah, ago, but really uh, interesting. You know, he it's he been was, a while, but I've heard some of it. Yeah, it was produced by Robbie Robertson, and mm-hmm. between after the the second band album, you know, the self titled one and Stage Fright, mm-hmm. and Levon Helm plays on it too. So it's almost like almost like a almost like a band album, you know. Mm-hmm. But he uh, he was from I think Memphis, Tennessee. Um, but he, uh, he fled the draft. He was a, he was a pacifist. And so he was based in Toronto and that's how the guys in the band became aware of him. Right. And so they produced him and he, he didn't come back to the States until president Carter, you know, um, decrim- decriminalized Anderson. all the draft dodgers. Yeah. yeah. Or pardoned him, I guess. And so, mm-hmm. but yeah, I've forgotten what an absolutely great songwriter he is, but the, he, he died a while back. He was on that Elvis Costello, uh, spectacle show mm-hmm. not long before he died. Uh, they had different, you know, artists on every uh, every episode, but um, you have yeah. a song called "Spinning Jenny" or something like that. Uh, yeah, is it called "Spinning something Jenny" like that, or yeah. "Cotton Jenny"? Something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, a lot of people covered his stuff. Amy mm-hmm. Lou Harris did some of his songs, and um, seems like somebody else had a hit with maybe Atlanta Rhythm Section or some. I don't know, but um, in the late seventies. But yeah, mm-hmm. really. He was he was another guy too that like really was a uh, he worked alone you know for years but then later in his life he d- he did a lot of co writes so you know, he transitioned you know and it seems like there are a lot of people that do that effectively. What did y'all y'all remember anything about uh, Valdosta music or maybe the bunch before you or the bunch during your time over there? Anybody sh- jump out at you as? There's a really a neat secret history about Austin music. Yeah, you had like the Jets, which is yeah. Mickey mm-hmm. Thomas, mm-hmm. who went on and played with Jefferson Airplane, mm-hmm. Jefferson Starship, and then Starship. Starship. I think he's still pretty yeah. much Starship <laughs> now. I think, yeah. he I think is that's pretty much now. him now. Hmm. But uh, he was he from, was from uh, Douglas K-Row. or, or K Row. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Went to Valdosta State, I believe. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, and the first the first serious band I was in um, it was called the Black Eyed Susies and we actually we did a, a record it was kind of real early sort of alt country type stuff about 1990 91 but the 
we had a keyboardist and pedal steel player named Tim Teasley. You know Tim? Yeah, I know Tim. Yeah, and um, and he was wasn't he in the Jets or not? I don't know if he was with the Jets. I know he, he played he, around. He may play with Mickey Thomas and something him, else, yeah. and he, he played around those that guys. Age. But yeah. yeah, I remember him talking. This is probably in 1990. He was like, he was telling me about you know Mickey Thomas stories. But he was like, that guy's voice was like. I mean, you, you just couldn't imagine how great it was, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I haven't liked his pop stuff or whatever, but, I mean, his voice is, like, next level, you know? Mm-hmm. I guess the he Elvin Bishop thing in was the about, first. Yeah, pulled around, fell around. around. Doing he the surfaced on that. right that there. That was him. <laughs> Man. And um, all they put on the record was Elvin Bishop. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so if people thought, that damn Elvin can sing so high. Yep. I think they were on Austin City Limits in like '76 or something, and so there's a video of mm-hmm. um, of him of Mickey singing that song with them, you know, from that Austin City Limits show and one of the early seasons. Really impressive singing. Mm-hmm. The the other thing though is that Valdosta, you know, that's more sort of uh, straight rock and roll, but then Valdosta also has sort of a secret history of uh, punk and new wave, um, you know, influencers. Uh, there's a really famous producer. Um, named Don Fleming, who mm-hmm. lived in Valdosta for years, I think is from there, but he produced, uh, he was in a band called um, Gumball, I believe, in, in the 90s, but then he produced Sonic Youth, mm. Teenage Fan Club. Cool. Um, yeah, and he and he lived, the, he, so he and these other guys I'm about to mention all lived in a big house on Patterson Street. Yeah. Um, there used to be a, it's a beautiful old house, uh, and but back then there was a, a real cheap coin-op laundry right in front of it. I remember that from when I was a kid. And so it was a dumpy house at the time, but it was like all these musicians. But it was also, there was a guy, excuse me, named Tom Smith, who uh, later went on to be a real in- innovator in industrial music. Mm-hmm. And Tom um, Tom and I became pretty good friends when I was in college because he moved back from Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. And he was kind of between between records. And he was a big influence, like the guys in like Ministry and Nine Inch Nails were just like, Wow. They're like Tom. Tom Smith is our, you know, is our God or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, Tom was a nut. But um, but yeah, so he was from Valdosta. He was actually from Adel, but he he was again lived in Valdosta for college and was there a lot. And he lived in that house with Don Fleming, and then also um, the guys in the Unknowns, mm-hmm. um, who are were on Sire Records in the late seventies, and then they came back to Valdosta. Um, and then uh, they they really became sort of a linchpin of the scene, especially back during our days, because mm-hmm. the unknowns uh, had a studio um, and like the black the, the black eyed Susie's that I mentioned. We did our demo mm-hmm. with uh, <clears throat> with Mark Neal is his name, and then later he produced. Uh, that was the guy that Black Keys. Yeah, right? yeah he just did. Yeah. Yep, he did that Black Keys record about ten years ago and won a Grammy for it. So mm-hmm. you know that house full of guys were all these people that ended up making a huge impact. You know, on an international level. You know, and they're all from Neat. Valdosta. And that's cool. Pre pre unknowns, all those guys were in a band um, called the Stroke Band. Mm-hmm. I was like Don Fleming and Bruce Joyner was the front man of the of the unknowns, and he had some sort of congenital. Um, disability, and so he he walked with a cane, but was a really interesting front man and singer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then then the rhythm section guys, and so they lived out in Los Angeles and San Diego for a lot of years. But then by the early nineties, they had migrated back here. Mm-hmm. And um, and when he was doing the Black Keys record, Mark Neal, um, he was Valdosta based, mm-hmm. but they still did all that in the Muscle Shoals area mm-hmm. because at the time the Muscle Shoals Sound Studio, which I've been to before. Um, wasn't set up the way it is now where you can do tours of it and it didn't have a good working. So Mark took all his equipment from Valdosta up to Muscle Shoals and they did that Black Keys record mostly there. Wow. So, so yeah, Valdosta's had a lot of interesting mm-hmm. folks. And then there's also a um, – uh, Wright is her last name. She's a R and b singer from Hey Hira that's had a really great career too. So there's a lot of um, – I hate that. I'm forgetting her name, but she's a yeah. great singer. But – um. Yeah, so there's been a lot of really interesting musicians and artists, you know. Well, that, that is, is such a melting pot, you know. Yeah. It's a huge, sprawling southern city, you know, and uh, they have a military Air Force base right there. Mm-hmm. They have a four-year university now, right? Right. University. Yeah, I work there, yeah. Do you? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, what are you? Well, I'm a, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a licensed therapist, and so I work, I'm the associate director of the counseling center there. That's my day job. Cool. Enjoy it. It's been it's yeah. been a blast. Then they have uh, the outlying communities or small towns surrounding it. That's mm-hmm. where we drew a lot of our crowd on mm-hmm. Friday and Saturday night yeah. when I played there. Yeah, people come. And from- North Florida is only like 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. 15 minutes away of the Florida line. Yep. Mm-hmm. So a lot of interesting things happened there. I, I actually met the world wrist wrestling champion. <laughs> he was a big uh, fan of ours. He'd come out to see us on the weekends. Cl- uh, Cl- uh, Cliff or Cleve. Cl- Cleve. 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 Huh. That, that sounds familiar. Wow. He was from Pavo. Uh-huh. He was an arm wrestler, right? Uh, wrist said. wrist wrestling is what they called it. Wrist wrestling. Yeah. Uh, the world champion. I remember we it was a pretty big deal for when Wide World of Sports was showing up in Pavo. <laughs> um, who was that guy that either discovered or had something to do with Charlie Crockett records? Wasn't he a Valdosta guy? No, that's too? Mark Neal. That's Mark Neal, the that's guy we were talking about. Yeah, yeah that, the one I was mentioning that works okay. that did the Black Keys. I yeah, it was. He Charlie, produced a couple of Charlie's He recorded records. at his studio in Valdosta. Yeah, it's in on Valdosta. Valdosta. Street. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, really, it's a, it's a neat studio. Y'all um, familiar with him, I guess. Yeah, you know, his previous yeah. studio is where my band, the Black Eyed Susies, did our, our demo um, back in like 1991, I believe it was. And then Mark went back to the West Coast for a number of years, and then he had come back here not long before he did that Black Keys record. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he and but now he's got a, a different studio that he set up. Um, I think it's both tape and digital based, so it's analog and digital. And he, uh, you know, he's done the I think a couple of Charlie Crockett records. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there and a couple other, um, couple other label projects. Yeah, there's a YouTube thing with Charlie Crockett. Uh, You'll get to see Valdosta. He's traveling all around. So. Oh, cool. So if you ever need to just check out our, our city of Valdosta, mm-hmm. just look it up. <laughs> He's driving around in his Ford truck. Mm-hmm. Cool. Doc Holliday from Valdosta, right? Doc oh, yeah. Holliday. Yeah, that was the name of the place that the Jets played, Doc Holliday's, Doc Holliday's Long Branch yeah. Saloon. Five Long Branch yeah. Saloon. Five points. Yep. I never uh, played there, but it was still, when I was in college, it was yeah. still I never open. Did and, yeah, I've, a lot of places. I think I threw up out right outside of it a few times. <laughs> yeah, back in college, I, I hurt myself there a few yeah. times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, who was the guy from White Cross and Black Eyed Susie's? What was his name? Uh, Black headed guy with you talking about Will? W- Will Walton? Yeah. No, there's that were, another guy. That, that wasn't. The, that I was bought, gonna say that wasn't the that name. bought a seagull from us. Next thing. And it seemed like something. That was his band there, right? Yeah. Yeah, the Black Eyed Susie's. Well, there, was, maybe, there was a Waycross guy in my, uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, well, maybe not. I thought it was Black Eyed Susie's that he mm. was in. I came over here in the mid 80s because I was kind of early into the Graham Parsons thing. And I, was, and I tried to find, I think it was Billy Ray here. And I think it's yeah. it who we, but, um, mm-hmm. and I think I briefly talked to him because I was, I was just trying to find something out because this is before he became more discussed in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't remember any other link to as far as musicians. Until I met you guys um, uh, from here, I don't think anybody in that band was. He went to college over there, and it seemed like there was some kind of altercation between him and Crosstown Music, and he left on kind of bad terms. Like maybe it had uh, skipped out on his loan. I mean, uh, uh, payments, payments for his something. instrument. Hmm. Hmm. I can't remember that boy's name. But he wound up in a band over there, and I was thinking it was Black Eyed Susie's, but maybe it was, there was another sh- lazy, lazy something, lazy Susan, lazy. That's, that was Will's. Uh, okay, mm. okay. Well, Will Wheaton. Will Walton. Will, Will Wal. Okay. A late. Uh, well, maybe this guy lazy played. Lazy something. Uh, lazy Susan, I believe. Do <laughs> you remember them? I don't, but mm. um. Mm. Okay. I don't remember a lot, so that's uh, <laughs> true. I mean, either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Speaking of Graham Parsons, we all did a, uh, with John. A, that's right. A Graham Parsons night at the Creek. Creek, yeah. Oh, that's right. I was telling him on the way over here, that I think prior to us starting back up gigging, that was 2014, I think. Wow, I don't know how y'all remember years. It all runs together. <laughs> well, yeah. So stupid. Not me. Not me. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, because I think it was about a year later, and uh, yeah, and I came over and did that. I remember I, I was really unhappy with my performance that night. I don't remember what had happened, but um, but it still was fun, though. Yeah, I think that you was the last time I played. You were with your performance? Not happy, yeah. Uh-huh. Don't remember what, but or what or why was going on, because that's, you know. Mm. 
I remember that it happened. See, I'm, mm-hmm. my memory's good as far as that, but anything else, yeah. I, I remember. remember it was a good time. Yeah. I, remember. I mean, we, we did, I think we did a song for you uh, as mm-hmm. a group or something. Did we do all Parsons songs or was it? Did we call it something to do with that? It might have been like a, more of a songwriter night because I think I, I did think a couple of originals too. Back when they was letting me do the, the front porch, front, the uh, back porch, porch session or whatever, Saturday night porch jam hmm. fest or porch, porch jam, porch jam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Might have been that. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got a lot of crossing paths back in two of. Ever so often, but I need to get you back over here, or need to get you all back over here to play. Yeah, we'd love to. Absolutely. One of the festivals. I think the got first, few... first time I met you, Dave, I mm-hmm. think, was uh, you were playing up on the roof at uh, Steel Magnolias oh, a, long, really? a long time ago. I can't mm-hmm. climb them stairs anymore. Well, yeah, they it, they went out of business finally. They did. Yeah, not because of the business failing. Just, I think yeah, the I owner was like, "I'm, I'm through." Food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been. They're trying to get somebody to come yeah. in and reopen it, but mm-hmm. laying that roof was no fun. Man, that was crazy. I'm you, well, I enjoyed it, it once I got up there. yeah, once you got up there. <laughs> yeah, it was but fun. I dreaded. Uh, you realize you have to go back the load down. in yeah. and the load out. Was it four flights or? It's a lot. Yeah, At three first, or four. Yeah, because yeah, grand it, wide then it staircase to the very top. Yeah, short. Mm-hmm. Yeah, talk four. about a load in. Yeah, that, there's four. Sure. Well, you know, the original Ashley Street Station was actually pretty near there back mm-hmm. in. Um, again, mm-hmm. this is the very early '90s because like the Black Eyed Susies and some of his bands played there. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they also, uh, but it was actually the original Ashley Street Station was opened by a Griffin Buffkin that owns. Uh, Southern Soul Barbecue oh, yeah. over at St. Simon's. You know, he was at VSU and he's an old friend or VSC, I guess it was mm-hmm. then. And um, and so that was his club. And so then this other guy has reopened it and it's been going for years now. But it's, I don't, well, it was on Ashley Street briefly when it reopened. But that was an interesting situation too because uh, he always wanted to play, he always wanted to have bands up on the second floor because it was this huge open, you know, almost like just a, I don't know what you call it, you know, almost like almost like a warehouse, you know, big mm. storage, open mm. second floor. But the only thing was a dumb waiter. That's the only way he had steps. <laughs> but then there was a dumb waiter, you know, that you had to do with ropes wow. yeah. to get the gear up there and everything. <laughs> but the, the fire marshal would never let him do it, you know, because that was that building was the the wiring. That's uh, that's the one time where I've had he, a spark arc off of a microphone. Oh, no. And like, I mean, it burned my lip. Yeah, playing hey. there. That that was a that that was an adventure playing at the original Ashley Street, but that was down there near Steel Magnolias. Although I think Steel Magnolias was on Patterson, so it was a block over. Mm. But that was a cool place because a lot of uh, you know regionally slash nationally known bands would come through there and play. Um, you know, back in ninety ninety one ninety two kind of era. Mm-hmm. So that was an interesting time in I, Valdosta. I really loved playing in Valdosta. The the Ratio of women to men was extremely <laughs> lopsided, in in our favor. And uh, college town. Yep, yep. Uh, and it was just, it just felt so good. Uh, seventy five through seventy eight, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, we weren't there all the time, but we were there a lot. That was kind of like our home base. Mm-hmm. Oh, it. Things were still good as far as uh, ratios in the 80s. Mm-hmm. I, I think, I think there was a place you, <laughs> you mentioned the American Legion a while ago, and mm-hmm. I don't remember if it was exactly that or if it was a, a VFW or, or whatever it was, but they didn't have a lot of music there back in those days. And it was kind of like, best I can remember, you'd take uh, Bay Tree, wasn't that Bay Tree, that led directly into the back of the college mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then you take a right or a right, left kind of around and you take an immediate left and there used to be a uh uh hoagie place sub sub place oh that was yeah that was, it's called hoagies and then later it's called oh, jeff's right. yeah yeah that was our hangout back in the 80s yeah that yes. was and and a lot of live music there too at jeff's the, yeah. the second place it was but yeah and, hoagies uh, was the, what it was called in the 70s seems like we used to have to meander down if you go past that you go past the graveyard on your right, and somewhere back in there was a little VFW or American Legion where we would go ever so often. They had the best steak and baked potato cooked mm. right there in the back. 
pitcher of beer, pool tables. That that's, was where we. That sounds like the American Legion had supper because they, they did have food mm-hmm. there back. Then. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, but it, the building's still there, and it's still the American Legion. But they haven't had live music there since probably the nineties. Mm. Um, now it's just purely a place for the you know the the veterans to go that are you know that pay membership, and mm. it's more of a more like a private club. But yeah, for years it was one of the yeah. great because it was you know everybody could walk there from campus right by the college. Yeah, yeah. so it was awesome. Mm-hmm. Played a lot of gigs, and that's so. where I saw him play the first time. That's that, that gig that uh, you know was so influential on me was was uh, in, in Inspector Thirteen. They were playing there, and I was like, "Wow, these guys, they're doing it!" And I thought it was so neat, you know. Did both of y'all go to college there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you study? Uh, political science originally, and then I uh, went back later and got my master's in special education. So I'm a teacher. Oh, okay. Elementary? Elementary. Salas Mahone? No, I'm actually in Brooks County. We're Quibbin, oh, okay. Georgia. Quibbin. Over. Mm-hmm. I'm in, just west of more than Georgia, so I'm just mm-hmm. one county over. But, yeah, that's what I do. I wonder how that town got its name. Quit, man. <laughs> Quit, man. Quit, man. Quit. I know. A lot of, a lot of interesting little towns around Valdosta. I dated sure. a girl from Quitman while I was playing there. She quit you. She used to say that a lot. Maybe, maybe that's how it got his name. Quit, what? man. Happened a lot, I guess, over there. <laughs> what happened to you, girl? She quit, man. <laughs> how about this? This is another memory of Valdosta. All right. It uh, scared the hell out of me because it was after the club. We was riding around drinking, or I was doing the riding around. Somebody else was driving, and... I Somebody was, else was drinking. I was uh, <laughs> good cover. Probably, I probably had the buzz and everything going on then because they took me out to that dip by a lake. Oh yeah, Cherry Creek. Mm-hmm. The dip. Yeah. The dip. I'm telling you, and and he was hauling ass too. And as a passenger, all you see is the road just quits, and there's water that yep. you're you're flying into. And once the car lands, it goes boom, and there's still road there. You just can't see it. Damn. And the ones that know about it <laughs> mm-hmm. play jokes on the ones who don't. Right. Yeah, I remember that one. That was one of the first places Probably I went. why it's closed off to through traffic. Now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's closed now. But I used to take my when I was first driving, I would take my car and just kind of just go out and sort of stop and just sit there and just look. It was pretty, but then in college, you know, yeah, we'd all, you know, go out there on dates with girls and stuff like that, both, both to scare them. And then also not, sort of like a you know lover's lane type of situation, you know, obviously, but what do you call it? The cherry, cherry Creek it was cherry the, name Creek. Of the, the neighborhood and the lake. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, cherry Creek Lake. And then, so basically that was, you got from one side of the neighborhood to the other by going through that. And yeah, it's usually just two or three inches of water underneath mm-hmm. the little paved area and it dipped down and then you went back up into the other side. So, <laughs> but yeah, for, especially people who weren't from Valdosta and especially mm-hmm. if they had a few beers, you know, yeah, you yeah. could really, you could really freak them out. They got me. <laughs> and then we also have a really uh, famous place. Actually, it's between Valdosta and Quitman mm-hmm. where you, there's a road and you go down and it, and it looks like you're clearly going uphill Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, it's a significant uphill grade, and yet your your car rolls forward. Wow! What? Remember that road? I'm trying. I can't. I, I'm sorry. I'm drawing a blank. It's not. Uh, it's either toward yeah. where Spook Bridge is, but it, I can't think of the name of the road. So it's not uh, eighty. Uh, it's off of eighty four. Yeah, that's right. You yeah, go. Almost parallel, you turn off of eighty four. It's like perfect. Yeah, and then you go down a little ways, and then you just you stop there. And mm-hmm. are you, you really going uphill, or is that an illusion? I think it's an illusion. It's an illusion. It's some kind of. But it, I mean, it, it's really disconcerting. You know, the first time you do or it, or it's really haunted. Yeah, because like <laughs> you're going. It's like I'm clearly going uphill, and the car's rolling forward. You know, yeah. you put it in like neutral. You know, and this is back old cars. You know, and you could easily do that. And. <laughs> Yeah, man. So we, that was always good for a freak out for some some people at college, you know, like ah, I need to go home. Mm. We well, all want to take a little break and sure come back and did y'all ever come up with any songs? Yeah, we might can do one or two. All right, good. Cool. Okay, we'll be right back with our guest, Magnetic South, and we're back. No I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Something in my brain won't let me stray Something in my veins gonna find its way Something in the water taught me how to pray When the cold black water finds its way into your veins You'll never be 
All right, so I'm John, and that's Mike from Magnetic South. We're uh, based out of Valdosta, Georgia, and we're going to do a song now called Mineola, which uh, is available on all the usual streaming services. It's from an older EP of ours called Ola, and uh, Mineola is a little town just north of Valdosta, and we thought we'd write a little song about it and about living in our neck of the woods. That's almost home Horseshoes and hand grenades Piney woods where old boys roam With their rifle and their girlfriend They're gonna make their mama proud But Barry Pie, the rebel colors fly And you never think out loud Morning, how's your mom and them? Can I borrow that backhoe? Nothing's changed except the daughter's names And the creeks are running low Mineola, Georgia, basking in the glow Mineola, Mineola Never meet a stranger there A firm handshake means good people See you around now, y'all take care Every day is an occasion Bring the family, break the bread A fishing rod, your faith in God Mineola born and bred Mineola, I'm just passing through On my way to parts unknown It's looking like the future's gonna swallow you If it don't choke on your bones Mineola, Georgia, leave them all alone In the pines, in the pines where the sun never shines And you shiver when the cold wind blows All right, this is uh, another song of ours. Uh, it's called Exit 31. It's on the Motel Trance uh, album, which is also on all the different streaming services. And we actually have uh, CD copies of it, too. Um, but this is uh, this came about the the Georgia or the the U.S. Uh, interstate system renamed or renumbered all of their exits, and so Exit Thirty One no longer exists. But I think it was up somewhere below Macon. But uh, this is a true story. I did pull off on that, on that exit at one point. So here we go. At exit 31 Blinded by reflections Of a tired setting sun Pulled into a motel I did not want to stay Rest 15 minutes Then head out on my way Remember when I told you that I'd go anywhere? Well, a promise is a promise, and I'm halfway there. Lipstick on your collar, a tattoo on my arm. Reminding me of where I'd been A little cursed, a little charmed My hands were never steady My aim not always true 
Blessings were many, but victories were few. Remember when I told you that I'd go anywhere. I've broken every promise and I'm halfway there. I thought a change was for the best and good intentions would do the rest, yeah. written you a letter and I put that letter in the mail describing every face and voice I've known in great detail I wish we could have traveled to corners far and wide where all our friends were strangers who just rolled out with the tide I wish I'd never told you that I'd go anywhere. I've broken every promise and I just don't care. Y'all, that sounded great. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Man. Hope that y'all enjoyed it as well. Uh, I mean, I'm disappointed that uh, I didn't hear any punk in that uh, those renditions. It's there somewhere. Huh? <laughs> it's always in there somewhere. <laughs> Punk, punk's an attitude. <laughs> yeah, both of those songs are you know full band, you know yeah. rock and roll chargers yeah, yeah on, in, in, in the recorded form and when, when we played them live so that was a very different arrangement doing them acoustically like that cool kind of uh you look back on that scene that dwight yokum came up with cow punk remember mm -hmm. that oh that was, that was my era that's, that's, that's your era too you know that it <laughs> it, it, it it's genesis was punk mm -hmm. out in california los angeles and yeah all, but look what it spawned it was oh, yeah. like Dwight yokum is traditional as it gets yep you know? But he he opened up for X and, mm -hmm. but yeah, some of those bands th those were huge influences on both of us. Uh, uh, Los Lobos, mm -hmm. uh, Rank and File, um, who else? The True Believer. Well, that was the True Believers a little bit later because that helped Alejandro Jason Escobedo, the Scorchers, Jason the Scorchers. But they, yeah, they were they were from Nashville, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, but just a lot of great bands in the mid '80s what that were doing that, that thing. Other band? That uh, sound. Was it Cock Robin. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Had a lead a girl lead singer. Uh, Are they the ones that did When Your Heart Is Weak? Yeah. 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 That was that a great was, song. That was like the it one was, man. hit song they had. I yeah. loved that. I bought the whole album. Oh, Lone oh, Justice right. was another band from that era. Lone oh, Justice, yeah. yeah. Maria McKee. Yes, yes. Maybe I was getting the two of those confused. Maria McKee was mm -hmm. the one, yeah. I think she sang on uh, Dwight Yoakam's first album on that. She probably did. One song. Yeah. I went to go, I, went, I got tickets to see you too. Um, it was the Unforgettable Fire Tour, like 85 down in Jacksonville. And mm -hmm. real, although I liked them then, you know, but I was really a big fan of like the war album. Like when I was in high school, I was a big fan of you too. But mm -hmm. I really, I went, it's like, because Lone Justice, I had read that Lone Justice was going to be the opening act. I was like, great. Cause I was, I was just in love with that record. And um, get, get down there, and it's this band. It wasn't them, it was some band called the Red Rockers, you know, who that's on China, I believe, and yeah. Blood from a Stone, which they were okay, but I was like so crestfallen. I was like, I'm going to see so they Lone Justice. They Lone Justice, but Lone yeah, Justice. Yeah, but apparently couldn't make it. There, were, there were several opening acts, but the way it was marketed was that Lone Justice was the tour opener. But what it, was it, the song that they had now? Which, which band? Lone Justice. Way, Ways to be wicked. Tom Ways Petty. to be wicked. Actually, Tom Tom's song. song, but yeah. And they, yeah. Actually, he and I uh, do that. We, we cover mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's a cool, Tom cool Petty tune. Tom Petty wrote that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
It was never <laughs> finished uh, until he, he did that playback box set, like in the I don't know late nineties or whenever mm-hmm. that came out. That was a great box set. Mm-hmm. But they went in and like apparently the drums weren't good, and so that that George Draculus, who was the Rick Rubin uh, engineer mm-hmm. guy, played played the drum track. But all the rest of it, I think, was recorded in like eighty two, probably on the um, Long After Dark mm-hmm. sessions, is when mm-hmm. they did that song, like eighty two ish. So they went later on. They went and added a different drum track to it, but mm-hmm. um. But yeah, so it never really came out in, until in Tom Petty's version until the late nineties. Mm. But it's a great song. Yeah, you know, a lot of those bands were big, <clears throat> big influences on us, and it, yeah. especially uh, one band that he and I both love and have really bonded over is uh, that side project of X called the Knitters. Um, it was mm. Dave Alvin from the Blasters, and then um, John and Xine from X, mm-hmm. and um, and then who was the bass player, stand up bass player? Was it just a guy who wasn't in a band per se? Uh, it's- I can't remember his name. He still mm. plays with John Doe solo, though. Okay. Mm. But, yeah, really a uh, great record. And that, that came out in, again, like, 85, 86, you know. And it was, like, all of the sort of, you know, you know, underground music people in Valdosta, everybody had a copy of that record and loved <laughs> it. And, yeah, so that, that really was one of those sort of gateway drugs. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, my dad got me into Redheaded Stranger, like, right when it was a new album, like, in 75, and I love mm-hmm. that record. You know, I have it memorized. But mm-hmm. really getting deep into country really came from those West Coast bands, mm-hmm. you know, that really explored that part. And they they all started as punk bands, you mm-hmm. know, and, and he and I started as punk musicians and kind of worked our way back around towards what's now called Americana or, mm-hmm. you know, or Roots Rock or whatever you want to call it. We're doing a uh, stagecoach tour, Uncle Dave's Waycross Stagecoach. And by the time this is out, we'll probably have finished it. But uh, uh, it was fun. <laughs> no, uh, and we're doing two shows in Las Vegas, and we got a friend of Sean's out there to help us get those gigs. And they're a uh, he and his wife have a devil's duo. Devil's duo, and they do like murder ballad covers and stuff like that and mm. we got a gig with them on saturday night and then they managed to fill us a friday night with his band called the psy atics sciatics the sciatics and mm. uh the club uh, is a uh, uh, double down saloon but it's uh That's an awesome name. it's a pretty <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much a punk venue because mm-hmm. I went to the page and started looking at all the people who play there, and oh, I'm yeah. thinking, Uncle yeah. Dave. Yeah, Dave messaged me. He's like, "Is this gonna be cool? <laughs> <laughs> Am I gonna be able to hold their attention with a, of course, with an uh, Uncle Dave original? Oh yeah, just do what you normally do, but just drop your guitar about six inches lower, <laughs> sling it like that, and they're like, hey, he's a punk." <laughs> I think yeah. I'm gonna start off yeah. with Satan got a plug, Jesus got a plan. <laughs> Just spit a lot and mm-hmm. piss in the corner. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I'll go shirtless for that gig, mm-hmm. and I'll do some fake carvings on my chest. Yeah, like Sid Vicious. Yeah. Yeah. Get a master lock on a chain around your neck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going too deep in the. Uh... <laughs> The, the fashion side of the I world. I'm, I'm, yeah, more of the, like black I'm more of the attitude and <laughs> right. the, uh, yeah. I think <laughs> you're right. thinking, what? me think you think too hard. <laughs> you're like a, you look like a yeah. punk rock after school special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some, yeah. Mr. Rogers. The day Uncle my kids Dave. went punk. <laughs> oh, no. It's like, ah. Uh, heathens, heathens. Uncle Dave's neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Would well, you like to be my devil? That'll mean he going out to Vegas. Uncle Dave wins over the punks in Vegas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Got him like raising him up. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> probably, <laughs> crowd surfing. Yeah. Yeah. They'll probably be riding me out on a rail, yeah. tarred and feathered. <laughs> now that we they are do, looking They do double down there, so. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Punkle Dave. Punkle Dave. There, there you go. go. <laughs> I was Punkle Dave for a while. And, yeah. Drunkle Dr- Dave. Drunkle Dave. Dave. For a little while. <laughs> Uncle, was, Uncle uh, Dave Vicious. <laughs> not a pretty sight. What's a safety pin for? <laughs> to hold my diaper up. <laughs> <laughs> I did it my way. Mm-hmm. I did it. Yep. <laughs> keep this oh, hold, Lord. Keep this holding my nipple from whistling. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, you'll be here all week. <laughs> uh, Thank you. 
Og så er det nok, at man er på uret. Jeg har mig safety pants. Well, that'd be a good name for a band. Yeah. Whistling nipples. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or nipple, nipple whistle. whistle. Either yeah. one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, start a trend. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, y'all sound like your your histories are much like uh, ours as far as y- you seem to be audiophiles, you know, as far as getting those records and buying them when you were young and putting them on the turntable and smelling the, the pro- oh, yeah. well. Reading the liner you, notes. You, and maybe yeah. you didn't go that far, but no, I, I did. I probably did, yeah. <laughs> I just mm-hmm. love the smell of a freshly pressed album i just me too or 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 when once you peel the uh cellophane off you can get that print all in Mm -hmm. Mm, love it smells come and then the vinyl itself and that Mm -hmm. (laughs) yep that's still pretty much all listen to you know that one thing one regret i have is Speaking of regrets, I've had a few from my way, but uh, is that yeah our our albums are we have them streaming and then one of them too we have we still have CDs that we can sell but yeah there's nothing better than the you know a well made record you know but to me if you're gonna play a record it needs to stay in the analog realm you know so if we ever did that I'd want to just use tape you know and go the entire route of of that you know that way but yes I, I miss that you know I mean I still that's pretty much still all I buy is like every month I'll try to find a couple of Albums. Old records, yeah, yeah, that either I didn't have or I had on cassette or something like that. And, yeah, that's pretty much all I listen mm-hmm. to. Yeah. Like the convenience that every song in the world is available right oh, there. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Is that you, also, you kind of makes you lazy. Miss, uh, <laughs> you know, having to move eight crates of albums every time right. I moved. <laughs> yeah, not to mention those old wooden crates, you pick them up yeah. and the bottom falls out and all your records go down. I know, I've got I've got about 2,000 CDs too, so moving yes. LPs and CDs is brutal. Oh, but, man, I used to carry albums and my little uh, shelf stereo system uh, to the gig with me, you know. i just load it in my van and, you know, maybe this many albums. Take them all upstairs. I'm sure that's where my first hernia came from. <laughs> Climbing stairs, three flights at the King of the Road. But I'd take my component system, good collection of albums, and started taking uh, four-track reel-to-reel. Ah, yeah. It, uh, Akai, it was probably about that wide and that tall and heavy. Yep. And, uh, but... I had it all there because we were there weeks at a time, you know, sometimes. Mm-hmm. We played 13 weeks from January through March in 76 there. Hmm. And talking about six nights a week, we hours in the morning every morning. And you talk about burnout on one place, as nice as it was and as good as they were to us. Uh, after 13 straight weeks, you ready for a change. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I tell you, I wish clubs still would let you do residencies like that. You know, yes. it's, I, I, you know, it seems like there's not not the valuation of live music. And because it's, it's it's good, too, because, you know, you also know we got to learn new material because these same people are going to see us. And they, if we want them to come back, we got to learn mm-hmm. fresh stuff. And it really keeps, you know, yeah, you kind of cut your teeth, you know. Mm-hmm. We were constantly learning material in mm-hmm. those days. Yeah, new songs on the we pretty much was top forty, and we also went back. We were a big variety. We played everything from Brooke Benton to Freddie Fender to what was on the radio. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Ohio Players, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Brick House. <laughs> oh yeah, Commodores. Yeah, um, uh, it was just uh, Eddie Middleton was the front man. I don't know if you recall that name he was uh, originally from albany but he was uh key to the whole scene in in valdosta yeah we there's a lot of middletons yeah. in valdosta mm-hmm. well it's time for uncle dave's tale of the week sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry put your kids to bed <laughs> and uh <clears throat> Quote from the poem 
Lycidas by John Milton. Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with Ruth. And oh, ye dolphins, oh, la, and oh, ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. It's been now on 45 years, and I'm still not quite over it. After the breakup of the Down Home Band in October 1978, I took my little nest egg of money that I had socked away in a sock and bought a used car. Loaded down with all my worldly possessions, I headed to Valdosta, Georgia, and found a job in the stock room of Wilbro's Catalog Showroom. Y'all remember that place? Oh, mm-hmm. loved it. Yeah. The Nigel Brothers. Mm-hmm. The main impetus behind my move was a woman from Quitman. We had met when I played the King of the Road in Valdosta. Things were going right good between us, so I thought. During my down-home days, we would spend time together in Valdosta every four to six weeks when I'd come to town and all the stars aligned. Now here I was, a non-playing musician with a loft apartment out Park Avenue, and I guess you could call it a real job. We lasted about a month or two. Absence do make the heart grow fonder. By the early months of 79, I was promoted to position of warehouse manager at Wilbro's. I gave up my bachelor pad on Park Avenue and moved in with my musical buddies at 601 East Moore Street, or like they used to call it, Rock and Roll Central. (laughs) Homeward Angel was an extremely popular original band composed of some of my former bandmates from down home. John Randall Smith on drums and vocals and Ricky Alderman on keyboards. Their bass player was Bill Ferris from Waycross, who went on to work with Reba McIntyre and Leanne Rimes. Hmm. The band had a dual-headed monster comprised of Bob Beckwith and Pat Buchanan on lead guitars and vocals. Pat lives in Nashville now, a seasoned session musician who has spent time with Hall & Oates, The Gap Band, and James Taylor. Homeward Angel's rodeo back in the day was a motorcycle riding Waycross wild man named Jim Gibson. Everybody called him Gibbo, a big, big hearted man with a head full of curly hair and an infectious laugh that would peel paint off the walls. 601 East Moore Street was rock and roll central, an old plaster walled exterior with a long front porch the inside hardwood floors and high ceilings with a staircase leading to upstairs bedrooms and an idle back room filled with loose bricks, a sink, and a gas heater. I shoveled all the loose bricks out, moved a bed in, and called the back room my new home. The boys in the band would head out weeknights to play Long Branch Saloon or some other local bar while I would dutifully go to bed like a good warehouse manager. On this particular night, they come home drunk with mischief on their minds. Gibbo rolled that big Harley Davidson up the front porch, through the front door, down that wood-walled hallway, stopping just outside my closed bedroom door. At the count of three, about the time a homeward angel foot kicked my door open, Gibbo cranked down on that Harley, and it rumbled to life with the headlight. <laughs> I suppose I looked like Lazarus waking from the dead, bolt upright in bed, eyes glazed over in horror as I stared back at the headlight from hell. <laughs> open mouth scream, couldn't hear it. It was deafened by the roar of the lion at the door. <laughs> Laughter ensued, and if I slept at all the rest of the night, it would have been a miracle. (laughs) The story's been told and retold through the years, always bringing folks to tears of laughter as they melt with Ruth at my night of misery. It's been almost 50 years. Look homeward, Gibbo. I'm coming for you. (laughs) (laughs) Good stuff. Yeah, I'll, one of these days, Gibbo, I will get even. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching this, 
He owns a uh, package store, or he may be retired by that now in Brunswick. Ah. Yeah. So I'm over in Brunswick a lot. Uh-oh. <laughs> it might not be a, a damn Harley Davidson in your ear. <laughs> Dave go in there with a ski mask. This is a robbery, and he just shoots you like, damn it. Not supposed to happen. Remember me. <laughs> it's a prank. This was funnier on paper. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're supposed to shoot. <laughs> yeah, right. You could about you could, couldn't you about walk from six oh one more to Wilbro? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say they're yeah, pretty close. Close, yeah. close. close. Yeah. I'm driving an old what was that? It was a Dodge, uh, one of Dodge's cars. It was Capri. It was Capri. Uh, that sounds right. Sounds about yeah. right. Or that sounds like Ford. Chevy, Chevy Capri. Capri. It had a funny name. Sporty mm-hmm. little thing. Kind of a, a better, a better Pinto than Pinto was. <laughs> it was That's same. a low bar. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So the was motor the, wasn't behind my head. Right. It exploded Who's that a little less. <laughs> Who's the guy in the highfalutin p- pinto? Yeah, mm-hmm. really. <laughs> you can't hide money. <laughs> you can't hide that warehouse manager money. Yeah. yeah. That was fun. And I let that job led me to Tallahassee when they opened up a new store down there. I moved with it. Mm. To, that was after the girl broke up with me. And I said, I got to get out of Valdosta. Too much heartbreak. Seems to be a theme here. <laughs> you know, we, we're the ones who failed at getting out of Valdosta. Yeah. Oh, okay. We, we've made the best of it, I hope. Uh, well, <laughs> it works some for, people it works do. for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did y'all ever know uh, during that time when I moved back to Valdosta at Wilbros and everything, uh, I was out of the performing music scene, but I met a lot of other musicians that wanted to form bands and stuff. He had, oh, there's Dave. He he played with Down Home. Oh, hey, I even, hey. And uh, I, I did some gigs. I think some of them were at Long Branch. Uh, but the young guys that was I did some trio work with was a Chris somebody. Chris Coleman. Chris Coleman. Coleman. And they yes. had a band called? Yeah, what were they called? Give me a minute. They toured a... Regional slash national circuit. He passed away recently. He did. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he he got he had um I think some form of fairly early onset dementia. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The last time I saw him was at the very last Hey Hira pick in that they had before that land was sold, and then they built a big uh, grocery store, Harvey Supermarket on that land where for years that that Hey Hira pick in had been. Mm-hmm. But and it, you know his he and his family had always done that. <clears throat> but uh, and he was already a little bit sick then. But man. I mean, you know, he gave both of us, I mean, some of our earliest opportunities yeah, for playing live. Familiar with Remerton and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was like the big. He owned the he mill was, house. He had the mill house, mm-hmm. which was the first oh, yeah. kind of venue. In Remerton. In Remerton. Mm-hmm. It was an old, literally an old mill house. And, um, but at first place to really have live music in Ooh. that city. And long before every, every, every house on that road became a bar mm-hmm. with music. But, right. I mean, he was, that was. The place for yeah, he, a while. I got a lot of probably the first opportunities I got to play was, I was through Chris. So yeah, yeah. He's, he used to work at one of those music stores uh, out there. But there was probably another Sam, dude, Campbell Music, that performed with him. Was probably about the same age as him. I think they might have been right out of high school in seventy eight or seventy nine. That's about right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's like my older mm-hmm. sister's yeah, age. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the other boy's name? And there was also another guy over there uh, uh, hanging. Oh, Glenn played horn. Glenn, somebody, glasses. Uh, yeah, he was he was around about that then. Yeah, it doesn't ring a bell for me. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Roger Brainerd. No, Roger. Yeah. Okay, I don't know him, but I, mean, I think he was pawn shop. No. Maybe he worked at a music store too. I know he wound up at. Rhythm City in Atlanta. Mm. That used to be a pilgrimage. Yeah. Rhythm City. Oh, especially yeah. We in the did 80s. too. Had to, yeah. We did too. That was mm-hmm. the place to go. And yep. 
maybe uh, what was the one in Jacksonville? Marvin Kaye's. Oh, okay. Marvin Kaye's. Out. I always went to one in Jacksonville called American Music. American. That was a good store. Paulus had a store down mm-hmm. there where we bought a lot of equipment in the early days. Uh, how about uh, uh, Rutland's? <laughs> Many bought, of our instruments came from there. I bought most of my stuff from Rutland's music. Riley, Pat, mm-hmm. Pat mm-hmm. and Bob. Yeah, yeah. And Mama. Yep. Oh, I know. Yeah, Miss Rutland. There. Mm-hmm. She was in charge. Mm-hmm. It's a liquor store now. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, the original, the old one is part of First Baptist First Church, Church downtown, mm-hmm. and then when he built the bigger store out on Bemis, that's now a liquor store. Uh, how about that? Sad. I miss. I miss. Are those guys still kicking? I Riley. Think, Pat, Pat's still around. Um, Excellent musicians. Yeah, he was. Oh yeah, they all were great. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I mean, I, I know they're still around. I don't know. I know he just their mom obviously died years yeah. ago, but um, got out yeah. of it. Um, first, the first like times like that I really played like great vintage <clears throat> instruments, you know, they would occasionally, like, I remember I played like a early sixties Gretsch country gentleman that mm-hmm. they got in, you know, and, and I remember one time, you know, they had like a, like a probably a 1959 Fender Esquire mm-hmm. there for a while, you know, so that, that was like the first place that I got to play a lot of really great and realize there's something different here. We were talking about that earlier, you know, about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how different, how much better those old in- instruments are, not just cause of, you know, the fact that they're older, that, that certainly helps. But there was just something in the worksmanship mm-hmm. of those, you know, mm-hmm. early Fenders and Gretches and Gibsons that are just really special. Right. Yeah, but Rutland's was a great store. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I used to just hang out there and play and mm-hmm. talk. And I was on the hunt for an acoustic guitar in about 77. And uh, I'd been to the pawn shops and the music stores and it was due to Rutland's that this Air Force guy went to Rutland's and was trying to bargain with him. He was getting rid of a Takamini, which was the pre-lawsuit Takaminis. They were looked fashioned like, exactly like Martins. Like Martins. Yeah, yeah. And they said, no, but I'll tell you where you probably sell that right now. Go to the King of the Road, tell the front desk to ring Dave Griffin's room. And just some young airman, you know, or he's probably older than me, but uh, I I jumped. I threw my pants on and ran down to the lobby, and there he was. And I opened that case up, and it sung. Mm. Mm. <laughs> That's how you got yeah. that guitar. That my talk me that I gave away. Mm. That's glad, a whole nother glad story. Glad you're wearing pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good detail. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was it's important to do story. Story. It was an afternoon. And Music was, transactions in pants. It was probably, <laughs> uh, probably a Saturday or Sunday. I understand. And uh, we were just getting into this uh, uh, meditation. We had been reading a lot about meditation, and we didn't want to go the uh, uh, expensive route, which was buy a mantra. Mm. <laughs> so dial a mantra <laughs> buy one you know um, you have to you have to pay money for a real mantra mm. or you have to go to an established uh, yogi or whatever they're called guru mm-hmm. and take a class probably then we give you a mantra but you pay for the class we're all trying to do your sergeant pepper's album <laughs> so, <laughs> that, sounded, that sounded like a mexican guru though yeah. You're that guy. You're mantra. <laughs> where's, your, where's your guru from? Can you rent a mantra? Yeah. Or you have to pay? Yeah. Rent to own. Rent to own. <laughs> rent to own mantra. Here's the Four way more we got payments. Around that. This mantra is mine. The way we got around that was many nights after the gig, two o'clock in the morning, we'd uh, either be drinking and riding the roads or drinking in motel rooms or hungry after drinking and we'd go right over the bridge, 95, 75 bridge there overpass and there's Howard Johnson's all night mm-hmm. restaurant. Yep. And every now and then we'd go there and this little uh, Vietnamese or Thai waitress worked there. 
and we got to know her and she uh we were telling her about our uh interest in transcendental mm-hmm. meditation <laughs> and uh uh she whipped out this little business card that said nam yo ho ringe kyo <laughs> do what Num your whole what? Num your whole <laughs> ring get killed. And I said, say what? And uh, exactly. she what said, could go wrong? it means, basically, it means me if alley. you do good, good will come to you. Mm. And she says, you chant this. And I said, where are you from? <laughs> no. And so that was my mantra. I was chanting Nam Yo Ho Ring Get Kyo. And the phone rang. I was in my drawers. <laughs> and uh front desk said, there's a guy down here who wants to see you with a guitar. And so I thought, it works. <laughs> Heck yeah. Nice. That's where I threw on my non-transcendental jeans. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. How about, that's how about that's how a whole nother tale of the week. I'm, I'm, I'm learning it. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing, that's what it is. That's another uh, aspect of TM. How much did you pay for the guitar? I don't remember, but back in those days, it couldn't have been a couple hundred hundred dollars, and it was already used, and he probably didn't know what it was worth or anything, but it was good to me. I wrote a lot of songs on that old Takamini. Yeah, those old old lawsuit ones are great, Mm -hmm. great guitars. Mm-hmm. There. Dave left that one on the sidewalk. We've told it many times on here, but mm. I tried to uh, meditate a lot left, about it. Left it there, thinking mm. it might come back to me if I meditated, mm. but it never did. Some crackhead got in the way. Well, you need to start <laughs> jamming my frequencies, chanting your whatever, <laughs> numb your whole. <laughs> No nope. cock ring or whatever you say. <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Mm. Well, we're going to go out on that. And uh, we've talked a lot about Valdosta back in my day, back in y'all's day. And uh, I think what we need to go out this episode with is uh, y'all remember that girl, that young girl? She was, man, she was. Never mind. <laughs> I do. You need to be more specific. How are you supposed to say, yeah, I know who you're I talking about. I just said about. yes. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to play along. I was trying to like narrow it down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she lived right behind Duck Barnes. Remember? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Technically, I do. Well, folks, we uh, enjoyed having y'all. First Thank you. And Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. it was fun. Obvious. Uh, we appreciate awesome. y'all watching, listening, and uh be sure to subscribe and do all the bells and whistles and write to us on something the water podcast at gmail.com or go to our website, something water podcast.com. And join us on Patreon. Uh, something in the water podcast, the deep end. Uh, the deep end. Yep. Yeah. And we'll see you next time. Playing the cold black water. Just my